morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus as we gather for worship in his name this morning. Um, many of you are, are familiar faces to me. I, I'm sure there's a good number of you who don't know me. I'm Pastor Joel Nauman. I serve your brothers and sisters in Christ uh, just a few miles down the road at St. Mark here in Eau Claire. Because uh, of uh, certain circumstances, uh, Pastor Hamilton couldn't make it this morning, so I'm happy to, to fill in for him and, and bring you God's word this morning. I pray that the Lord would bless our time together, our worship, and, and the proclamation of the gospel this morning. Uh, let us begin with the opening hymn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you, and in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. With a voice of singing, declare, proclaim this, utter it, even to the ends of the earth. O oh, you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Sing out the honor of his name. 
all the earth shall worship you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For peace from above and for our salvation, for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. O God, from whom all good things come, grant to us, your humble servants, that by your holy inspiration. Please be seated. The first scripture reading uh, for our focus this sixth Sunday of Easter is taken from Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning at the 11th verse. Jeremiah writes a letter to the exiles. In it he writes, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord and will bring you back from captivity. 
I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This is the word of the Lord. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, Then they would have swallowed us alive when their wrath was kindled against us. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. The snare is broken. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The second lesson is taken from the epistle of James, chapter 1, beginning at verse 22. James writes, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is the word of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel appointed for the sixth Sunday of Easter, according to John chapter 16, we begin at the 23rd verse. Jesus says, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked me for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. This is the word of the Lord. Together we confess our common Christian faith according to the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn. We sing hymn 486, the first three stanzas. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word of God for our meditation this morning, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is taken from John chapter 13, beginning at verse 31. After Judas left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. Dear children, I am going to be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, love one another. Just as I have loved you, so also you are to love one another. 
By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is God's word for God's people. In the name of our Lord Jesus, dear friends. People are pretty good at identifications of other people, right? We, we take one little aspect of a person and we try to figure out on that basis something about that person, maybe even sum that person up, at least in our own mind. Sometimes this can be kind of effective. Sometimes we, we do it pretty miserably, but, but nonetheless, we like to characterize people uh, in certain fashions and kind of categorize them. For example, just consider how many different professions you can identify simply by looking at a person and seeing what they're wearing. You know, you, you see the scrubs that a person might be wearing, you think, looks like a nurse to me. Or you look at the, the lab coat and the stethoscope around the neck and you say, that, that's a doctor, it's a physician. You see maybe the, the coveralls, the dark gray coveralls or blue coveralls and, and gloves, and you say, eh, probably a garbage man or something like that, or, or the, the blue collar or gray collared shirt with the embroidered name, and you say, that he probably works, you know, a, a car mechanic or something like that, especially if you have the, you know, the rough hands that are oil stained. Maybe you look at the, the clerical collar and think that that's a clergyman, maybe a priest, a pastor of some sort. They do call pastors sometimes a man of the cloth, right? Or, or you look at people who, who protect and serve, like a police officer. Out in the community, they wear a uniform, and you know immediately that, that looks like a police officer or a fireman, for example. And even within branches of the military, you can tell that's a serviceman and even distinguish one branch of the military from another depending on the uniform that they wear. In the same way, when, when you have people from out of town, you can usually size them up pretty easily, maybe by their dress, maybe by how they carry themselves, by how they talk. And you can immediately say, well, you're not from around here, are you? And all the more if it's a person not, not simply from out of state, but, but from another country. And maybe you can even place the accent and say, this or that state, or maybe this European country or that, Right? The question for us this morning is, how do you identify a Christian? Scour the New Testament and you don't find specific commands in how Jesus commands us to dress. You're going to wear this or that uniform. You're not going to see any specific mark on a Christian like you might see the red dot of a Hindu woman or or the, the burqa head covering of a, of a Muslim woman. In generalities, the New Testament speaks about Christians you know, adorning themselves with their good character and dressing modestly, but beyond that, there's no specific commands in that regard. And when you consider that the Christian church is going to be made up of people from every land and language and tongue and nation and people under heaven... It's going to be a whole broad array, and, and they're pretty well going to be people who blend in with the community and look most like everybody else. Uh, but Jesus gives you the identifying marker of his disciples in the words we heard from John chapter 13 when he says, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. As I have loved you, so you are to love one another. And this love that characterizes Christians is first and foremost a love that we see God showering first upon us and then we reflect out into the world. As we look at John chapter 13, we may find it unusual. You, you ever think about this? You go through the Easter season, the whole season of Easter, these 50 days from Easter to Pentecost, and we're right drawing close to the end of it. And the way the readings from Scripture play out is maybe somewhat unusual. At the beginning weeks, it makes sense. Easter Sunday, you're always there at the empty tomb. You're hearing the message of the angels. He's not here, he's risen. The second Sunday of Easter, you're always going to see Jesus appearing to his disciples that first evening and then, and then appearing to doubting Thomas. 
But then you get into, you know, Good Shepherd Sunday, I am the Good Shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep and I take up my life again. But then after that, Easter 5, 6, 7, those last weeks, you get into John chapters 13 to 17 and you're smack dab right in the middle of Maundy Thursday before Jesus even begins his passion. And you wonder, what are we doing here? We went through all of this in the Holy Week and Easter Sunday and the resurrection and Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, and, and now we're back here on, in the upper room before even Jesus suffers. What is this all about? But if you think about it, it actually makes quite a bit of sense. You know, this is the moment where this is really Jesus' last moment of teaching with his disciples. The last real time he's going to have to spend and instruct them and prepare them for what is to happen after his suffering and death and resurrection. How life is going to be. See, you get the sense with all of Jesus' resurrection appearances to his disciples, and there were several, that he never really hung around that long. That he wasn't giving his disciples more full and thorough instruction and teaching. You don't have any long discourses of Jesus from after his resurrection. This is kind of Jesus' last moment and time with his disciples to tell them what they need to know to be prepared, not only for his upcoming passion, but for life after his resurrection. And to that point, these words in John chapters 13 to 17 become all the more practical for us because a lot of it is Jesus' instruction for this is how Jesus' believers, his people, are going to conduct themselves in the Easter reality, in the very ongoing reality that our Savior Jesus is risen from the dead and we live now and forever as Easter Christians in that joy and confidence of the resurrection. And so this reading in particular picks up when we talk about how we love one another as Christ loves us. It says, After Judas left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. John gives us the time marker in this section with those three words that we dare not overlook. After Judas left. That's a key marker for this. Not just because, you know, the snake among the 12 apostles has been weeded out and separated from them, but it's what Judas left to do. Judas is now going to carry out his evil work of betraying the Son of Man to the hands of sinners. And what that sets in motion is of the utmost importance. Jesus will, or Judas will go to Jesus' enemies he will look for that opportune time. He will betray Jesus into the hands of the Jewish leaders. They will put him on trial, condemn him, hand him over to the Gentiles, to Pontius Pilate. He will be crucified and buried in the tomb. And now, as Judas leaves to do this work, that puts the whole plan in motion and the wheels are turning in what will inevitably result in Jesus being hung on a cross. Nothing is going to change that. And it is at this moment that Jesus now looks at his remaining apostles and he says, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. Isn't that incredible? Right at the cusp of Jesus' passion as it begins, hours before he is going to be hung on a cross, after he has been spitten on and beaten and flogged, and a whole host of other abuses that he endures, resulting ultimately in crucifixion, Jesus picks this moment and says, Now the Son of Man is glorified. Yes, indeed. This is how you are to know Jesus from now on. This is how you are going to know the Son of God. Not simply as the Son of God and Son of Man, but the Son of God who was crucified for you. It's a title that goes on. It's an association for which we will evermore know and praise the Son of God, Jesus our Savior. From now and, and after he has 
glorified and raised from the dead and, and now for the rest of time and yes, even into eternity, that is how Christ is known, remembered, commemorated, exalted, glorified and believed on among the nations. You heard this the first Easter morning, right? When the women went to the empty tomb, they found it empty and the angel said, ah, you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He is not here, he is risen. So even after his resurrection, he is known as Jesus the crucified. Paul said to the Corinthians, my whole ambition among you was to know nothing and preach nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Even in, in the glorious revelation of St. John and some of those glorious visions he has of the heavenly throne room, Jesus is presented in that vision as a lamb who looks as though he had been slain. Even in one verse in Revelation, he's spoken of as the lamb who was crucified from the foundation of the world. This is the moment by which Jesus is known, believed on, glorified in as the one who gave his life even unto death on a cross for our sins. And more than that, Jesus says, and yes, God will be glorified in Jesus. So God the Father is glorified in this. Now you might think God the Father is already worthy of all glory and honor and power all by himself. He's God. He's almighty, as is Jesus Christ. So how is he glorified now in his son going to the cross? Well, again, here too, this is God the Father saying, this is the defining moment. This is how you're going to know me and call upon me as your heavenly Father. See, we often think of Jesus going to the cross as being driven and motivated by his love for us. And that is absolutely true. Absolutely, Jesus Christ loved us and gave his life for us to save us, deliver us from sin and death and the powers of hell and give us eternal life. And that certainly drove him and held him to the cross to lay down his life for us. But don't lose sight of the fact that first and foremost, the reason Jesus went to the cross is out of love to his heavenly Father. How many times throughout John's Gospel do you hear Jesus talk about coming to do the will of my Father, doing the will of him who sent me, and carrying that plan on to completion? And this was the plan. What unfolds for the next hours on Thursday and that first Good Friday were not a series of unfortunate events completely out of Jesus' hands. This was the plan from eternity. This was the plan God had in mind that he would send forth his son and deliver him even unto death to save sinners so that we might be called children of God. And in this way, you, you can look at God as your heavenly father, not as the angry just judge who just can't wait to clobber you for your sins until Jesus stands in between and takes the bullet for you, but indeed, you can see within the council of the Holy Trinity, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all aligned in their love and their mercy, their grace towards you and their fervent desire to redeem you and save you from sin and death. And so you rightly look at God the Father and call on Him as your Heavenly Father and trust in Him and love Him even as He loved you to the point that he gave up his own son unto death. In this, God is glorified. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus says, if God is glorified in him, in the son, God will also glorify the son in himself and will glorify him at once. See, this would ultimately result in Jesus being exalted again. One thing I think we don't often associate with crucifixion so much is the shame of it. See, in America, we're not such a shame-honor type of culture. Many cultures around the world are still a shame-honor culture. In Bible times, they were. We're not as much. And so we kind of lose sight of this aspect of crucifixion. We tend to um, visualize the agony of it, the physical suffering of it, which it absolutely was agonizing. But as you read through the gospel accounts of Jesus' passion, it seems to, to be very... Well, not so wordy when it comes to 
the, the agony and the physical grief of it. They speak very matter-of-factly and straightforward without embellishing all the details. And Pilate had him flogged. And they wove a crown of thorns together and, and put it on his head. And there they crucified him in such simple language. But the details that the evangelists spend more words on is the shame of it, the mockery Jesus received from, from soldiers being spit on and mocked and ridiculed, becoming the object of scorn to the entire world, it seems. To be hung on a cross was to be the greatest moment of shame and, and excruciating embarrassment that a person could undergo. And the Romans were, were ingenious, horribly ingenious at this. They would string these men up, these poor crucifixion victims, and line them along the, the well-traveled portions of the Roman Empire with the notice there so that even complete strangers who traveled the road could look at the agony and the shame of that person stripped naked, read the notice and say, I don't know this person, but he's getting whatever he deserves. That's how it would have appeared to everyone else who saw Jesus on the cross. You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and us. Let, let's see you come down now from the cross. And, and people who knew him and, and people who perhaps didn't know him, yeah, if you are the Christ, prove it. You better show it now. And even, even these two crucifixion victims, the thieves crucified with them for a time can't help themselves. Yeah, if you are the Christ, save yourself. And while you're at it, save us too. And that's how Jesus dies and is buried as one who's crucified. If it ends there in the tomb, then Jesus is the greatest fraud there ever was. He is proven to be a liar, a false Christ, and no Savior at all. And God the Father would not have that stand for his beloved Son. He would glorify his Son and glorify him at once so that what took place in Jesus' death on Good Friday would have to necessarily result in Jesus rising from the dead on the third day. You can never have Good Friday without Easter Sunday. You can never have Jesus' deepest humiliation without his greatest exaltation. You could never have Jesus ascending back to the right hand of glory the Father's right hand in heaven without first coming down to earth. You cannot have Jesus laid in a tomb dead without also him bursting victoriously from the tomb, alive and risen. Jesus says, in this the Son will be glorified and God will glorify him at once. It's as though the whole plan of salvation, it was already a completed, done deal in God's mind. Not one part of it would happen without all the rest of it necessarily taking place. And Jesus speaks in these terms. You could rightly translate these verses. Now the Son of Man was glorified and God was glorified in him. As though it's already a done deal. It's an accomplished fact in God's mind from all eternity. And now Jesus is just going to carry it out. So we see rightly that God is the one who has loved us, who has poured out his grace, his undeserved love on sinners. And in this, Jesus says, now this is how people are going to know you're my disciples. Because I'm not going to be with you anymore as I was before. People aren't going to see me hanging, see you hanging around me all the time constantly and know you're my disciples that way. He says, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you are to love one another. In a sense, this isn't exactly a new command. In the Old Testament, you already have the command to love your neighbor as yourself. But what Jesus is giving here that is a new command, this love now has a face. This type of love has a particular event that you can look at and point to and you can proclaim Jesus and say, that is love. And he says, this is the kind of love by which people will know you're my disciples. If you love one another, and Jesus isn't even talking about love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, though that's part of it. That's still part of Jesus' command. Here he's primarily talking about loving fellow Christians. Well, that should be easy enough, right? That should be the, the easiest type of love that we give. But sadly not. 
You see, it is very often in the people we are most familiar with, the people we spend the most time with, the people we should love the most, that we tend to take the most for granted, and yes, be the most unloving and uncharitable towards. There is within each and every one of us, even after we come to faith, this sinister, sinful flesh that is so curved inward on itself, all we can think about is ourselves. We are utterly selfish to the core, self-seeking, self-interested, and even in our most selfless works, tend to, in the back of our minds, think about, well, what am I getting out of this in the short term or the long term? How can I angle this to benefit me? We become so self-absorbed. We always want our way. We want things to be how we want them to be, and we think the church of God is our own place where things ought to be how I think they should be rather than it being the church of Christ. What a horrible, wretched thing it is when, when the world is looking at how Christians treat one another and scratch their heads and say, that's, that's what Jesus' disciples are all about. You can hear the horror stories of churches that are divided over such trivial things as putting a new carpet and what color the carpet should be. You can see sometimes Christians taking each other to court and, and bringing lawsuits against one another. It was one notable case some years ago where, where the local community saw this happen at a church torn apart completely and with derision writes this article when they report the events with the headline, See How They Love One Another. And we rightly look at ourselves and say, yes, still, even redeemed and loved by God, still sinful to the core, selfish to the core. And as much as we see this as an encouragement to love one another, we see this word of Jesus as an indictment, a condemnation. Say, how can I love like that? We need to be made new, entirely different, transformed from the inside out, from the heart to the outside Dear friends, this is exactly what the love and grace of God does for us. Before it becomes an example we follow, something we look at and say, okay, now I need to do something like that. Jesus' grace, God's love for you, is something that is transformative. It is for you. Jesus did this not to simply give you an example to follow, a path to walk. He says, I do this for you. And everything that you might otherwise have concern for yourself over, how I am right with God, what I need to do to get in His good graces, what I need to do to make sure I'm set in this life and set for eternity, which might take a lot of our time and energy, Jesus takes that all out of our hands and say, it's already solved. I've done everything for you. You do not have one concern to worry about in this life or in eternity because your salvation rests securely in my hand in my act of love for you. You are free. And in this freedom, in this transformation of the heart by faith, we understand now your whole life has been delivered back to you, given back to you, that you might freely shower this love on one another without a concern for myself, but with a, a self-sacrificing attitude and a love that is so uncommon and foreign to this world that it's such a joy and delight to witness when it truly happens. Therefore, dear friends, don't be surprised when it does. When as God's baptized children, He does transform you and make you new and make you to look more and more like Himself being ever conformed to his likeness and being transformed from glory into glory. And even as you'll spend eternity with him in heaven, perfectly loving one another and perfectly serving him, that you might start to see glimpses and signs of it already here on earth, an uncommon love that this world doesn't know or understand. And then in self-sacrificing love based on the grace of God for you, you love one another and put each other first in your lives, your needs, your wants, ahead of my own priorities and desires. That's how the world will know you're his disciples. That's how they'll identify you. And what a beautiful sight that is, dear friends, when you love one another. Amen.
And please stand. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Join to sing the offertory, Create in Me. Lord God, Heavenly Father, through your Son you have promised us that whatever we ask in his name you will give us. We beseech you, keep us in your word and grant us your Holy Spirit that he may govern us according to your will. Protect us from the power of the devil, from false doctrine and worship, and also defend our lives against all danger. Grant us your blessings and peace that we may in all things perceive your merciful help and both now and forever praise and glorify you as our gracious Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. And we join to pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Maybe seated for the closing hymn, we will sing hymn 385. Hymn 385.
Once again, good morning uh, to all of you, and I uh, thank you for the privilege to be here with you and share God's Word with you this morning. Uh, again, I'm Pastor Joel Nauman, uh, serving at St. Mark here in Eau Claire, um, filling in for Pastor Hamilton this morning. Um, the only announcements I see that he highlighted here in, in the bulletin is the every member visits that it sounds like you're planning, and uh, so he'll be keeping in touch with you to, to get those scheduled and uh, working with the committee, it appears, to, to get those underway. Um, also, the, the welcome to new members who are here since uh, May of 2021, uh, so uh, quite a, a string of new members, I think, who have joined the congregation over the past year. It looks like there's a new member potluck happening. Uh, it won't be Bible study this morning. At least Pastor Hamilton didn't tell me anything about that. Uh, but uh, Sunday school, I think, will go as planned, and so it might consider it a bit of an early fellowship time and uh, perhaps early potluck for that. Um, but once again, I, I wish you the, the Lord's richest blessings uh, here and in the week ahead as you go out and serve in his kingdom. I'll greet you in the back. <laughs> 